Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith featuring Marianne O'Hara and Lily King for Marianne's new book, Little Matches, a memoir of grief and light. My name is Adam, and I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. Uh, if this is your first time hearing about us, welcome. We're very happy to have you all join our community this evening, and we appreciate your support of Marianne and an independent bookstore through your purchases and attendance. Thank you so much. Uh, just a few nuts and bolts. Um, the chat and question box are open, so feel free to make use of those. Uh, remember to set your chat to all panelists and attendees so you can talk to other attendees. And please drop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window so they're not lost in the chat. Uh, please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy against abusive behavior and language. And at our discretion, any attendees can be removed from an event for partaking in such behavior. But we know that you will not do that. You're all wonderful. We are absolutely thrilled to have author and friend of the booksmith, Lily King, here with us to moderate tonight. Uh, Lily is the award-winning author of the novels The Pleasing Hour, The English Teacher, Father of the Rain, and Euphoria, one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2014, and finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and winner of the Kirkus Prize. Her latest novel is Writers and Lovers. Thank you so much, Lily, for being here with us. Thank you. And Thank of you, course... Name. We are beyond pleased to have with us Marion O'Hara for the launch of her new memoir, Little Matches. Written from a place of both grief and optimism, Little Matches asks, what next? Marianne is the author of the novel Cascade, which was the Boston um, Globe Book Club's inaugural pick, a finalist for the Massachusetts Book Award and a People Magazine Book of the Week. Little Matches is inspired by NineLivesNotes.com, a blog that Marianne kept while her daughter Caitlin was waiting for a lung transplant. Since Caitlin's passing, she has been certified by the University of Vermont's Larner College of Medicine as an end-of-life doula, so that she may better speak to the state of end-of-life care in our culture. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, Lily King and Marianne O'Hara. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Hi, Hi Lily. Hi, Lily. How are you? So great. So oh. great. Thank you so much for doing this and for being here. And I know that so many people are out there, and I have to just imagine you all crammed into the basement of the booksmith, <laughs> all your wonderful faces. Uh, but I'm, I'm so pleased, pleased to be here. And before I forget, I did light my little candle. And people who read my blog I did too. know I ask people to light a little candle. This is such a sacred book for me. This is not just another book. Um, another story. This is Caitlin, and I am so pleased to be able to celebrate her life and her story and her purpose. And I'm so grateful to Lily, an old friend and a wonderful writer for being here with me. So in this candle Aww. is for Caitlin and it's for everybody. It's for celebrating humanity. We've all been through a lot this year. Oh, it's beautiful. Haven't we? Yes. <laughs> um, I just, uh, this book, everybody has to know. I mean, I know it's only been out a day, so not everybody has had a chance to read it. Um, but it is just so mesmerizing, gorgeous, and, and, and truly profound. I, I just, I don't, I don't know how you did it. I, I really don't know how you did it. Um, and you did it, and I'm holding it. And I just want to say I'm so honored to be here. And I, Thank you. just huge congratulations to you. Thank um, you so much. I thought we would start by, you know, if you could just tell us a little bit about the book, and then I know you have a fantastic trailer to show us. I do. Well, it's a memoir of grief and light. It's me writing from inside immediate, raw, darkest grief. I wanted to, I wanted to make a record of it. And I did it very soon after Caitlin's passing. So it kind of feels like I can't even remember writing it. I only know that I did. I did it in a fever. I was sitting here at my desk to the point that my husband would come up at five o'clock and say, come on, bud, come, come have some dinner. So it's the grief, but the whole purpose of the book is, is looking for meaning and purpose. And why are we all here? What was Caitlin's life for anyway? What was my life? What is my life for? What is anyone's life for? So ideally, my hope is that the book will really inspire people to really think about their own lives and purpose and meaning and be inspired to live a good life. And I do have a little tiny book trailer, which um, 
I'm going to show and I'm going to share the screen so I can practice. <laughs> and I'm just going to show it right now. It will give you a good idea of the tone of the book and the questions it asks. Um, here we go. Here we go. After I lost my daughter, Caitlin, I looked for revelation. I became every human who has ever looked for answers to the hard questions. Where is she? Is she? Is there more to life than this life? Does consciousness survive death? Does my existence serve any real purpose? Does anyone's? So I wrote little matches from inside real time grief and I asked those big life questions. Caitlin became a real sage for all of us. She had so much wisdom. And the last couple of years while she was waiting for her lung transplant and she was on oxygen, it was easier to write than to speak. After her passing, many of her friends shared her writing with me, including text messages, conversations that would have been lost forever were recorded. So all of her old soul wisdom is in the book in a really cool way. I know I'm not the first person to lose what's most important to me. Humans lose all the time and lose hard. Little Matches is for anyone who loses and asks, now what? Okay. That. I love that. Good. I'd like to give a shout out to my artist brother, who Michael Bavaro, who made that. He's um, I'm very lucky to have a wonderful creative brother. Mm, and thank you. Um, and we very intentionally went from inside, serious questions, dark, per the personal, to outdoors, mm. to the light, to the universe, to the bigger picture, birds. So. Mm -hmm. I think it, it works nicely. Yeah, I do too. I, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why exactly this book works. Because, you know, when you say you wrote it in a fever and it's, you know, full of the raw grief, you know, you kind of think, ah, you know, I, I bet a lot of people said, you know, maybe you should get some distance on this material, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, is that you're a trained writer, you know, and you write fiction. And so you know scene and you know dialogue. And so it's not just like, you know, kind of a vomiting in a journal kind of thing. It's it's a very, very, very controlled piece of work um, with a, a very clear structure um, and, and clear intentions. And, and then, you know, you also, you're not focusing just on the small, you know, you are going back to the big picture and asking, the big questions. And, and I, I think that's really, really a, 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 an important um, reason for its power. And then the third thing is, is Caitlin, you know, she is such a great character. I mean, she's just, she just comes alive and you have so much material and um, you, you, we hear her voice in her own words so often. So she's, she's right there kind of writing the book with you, you know, which yes. is, you know, which we have to talk about because it, it, that, it feels like that. So I'm just wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about her and tell us kind of, you know, what you learned about her um, writing this book, because, you know, there are always discoveries, I think. And, and, then, um, and then I was hoping that you could maybe read a passage about her from the book. I would love to. Anyone who knows Caitlin knows that she was um, a, a wonderful human being and an interesting character. She, she kind of reveled in being a little bit of a badass, but she was extremely thoughtful. She chose her friends carefully and all of her close friends would say Caitlin was my best friend. She was extremely kind, really smart, thoughtful, kind of an introvert, but she could go wild and party for sure. 
Um, she would absolutely love that her yeah. her face is on the cover of a beautiful, beautiful book. She loved beauty. She loved art. But, you know, um, before her last birthday, she was turning 33, she had a very long conversation with one of her best friends, Jess Danforth, who was dealing with her own breast cancer diagnosis at the age of 32. And they were having a long, serious conversation about purpose and meaning in life. And Caitlin said that she feared that her purpose in life was to um, help others learn lessons. I think she had a lot of premonitions. And, and, and it wasn't too hard to have too many premonitions when you're that close to death. I mean, really, the only thing that could save her was a lung transplant. And a lung transplant can be a wonderful um, surgery that really works for a lot of people. And we certainly knew plenty of, of good success stories. So we were full of hope, but you know, on, on some level she was thinking in another way too. So that's why I'm so happy that I have so many of her wonderful writings. As I say in the video, she was, um, it was easier. We were living in Pittsburgh waiting for her transplant. We're from Boston. It was easier for her to write than to speak with the oxygen. And so we have a lot. Mm. It's really wonderful. And her friends shared a lot of it with me and I have, you know, tons of stuff that she sent me. So the chapters are peppered with her own sort of philosophical ruminations that are quite profound, I think. Do you feel like she, can you imagine who she would have been without this illness? Like, do you ever, oh, you know, yeah. think about the effect of it and, you know, what, what it brought her? Well, yeah, we, not just what it took away, but what it what it gave her. It gave a lot. It, we we both acknowledged that without her cystic fibrosis, we would have just been like, oh, those bad things happen to other people. And mm -hmm. even when the doctor first brought up the idea of you know let's rule out CF um, when she was you know two years old, I remember just thinking, oh, that's not going to be us. You know, we're, we're not going to be those people who have to go to the hospital every single week and go into the hospital for weeks at a time every single year. So it just makes you, you know, like with anybody who gets really sick or old, they start to think about what life is really for. And there's a little part in the book where I talk about how I was sort of fretting one day while Caitlin was waiting for her lung transplant, and, you know, just fretting about everyday things. And she was just like, oh, oh mom. You know, just in that way, oh, mom, don't you realize the only thing that matters is loving people and being kind, which just sounds so simplistic, mm. but it's, it really is true. Like at the end of your life, at the end of the day, what really matters? Exactly. What really matters? So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and we, she knew that. And she knew that from an, she was very sick when she was 11. She spent months in the hospital and. There's a passage in the book where she talks about um, how she really stopped being a kid at that year because she was just thinking about her mortality. Yeah. Do you, do you want to read that page, that, that yeah. page on page six? I will. We can just Lily and I were also talking about, you know, I, what I love, Lily, thank you so much for what you said about the book. When you... We all know when we write a book, it looks so easy when it's done and you can't really see the, the crafting that takes place. And I just love when somebody like you reads it and recognizes it and appreciates it because it, it was a lot of crafting and work that went into it. And I, I'm very grateful for that to be recognized. And so here in the book, I really needed to introduce Caitlin as a character to people who don't know her from a hole in the wall. And I really needed to... Um, not bog the reader down in years of her past and growing up. So I needed very quickly to dis to tell the reader who she was at, as a as a child and growing up, and also what it was like in real time as I was writing this part. Okay. Okay. As I stumble inside this world Caitlin grew up in, I discover something. When you lose a child, all the separate ages they ever were become newly present. My daughter is no longer just 33, but all of the ages she ever was. 
She is three and I am driving her to preschool when I hear her squeaky voice from the back seat. Maybe I'll make some friends. Mm -hmm. I walk into the kitchen and she's there with her hands planted on her hips, face wet with exasperated tears, scolding me in a scene we laughed about for years. Don't you know? Don't you know you're not supposed to shout at a little girl like me? <laughs> in the airport, I am laden with bags and need to let go of her hand. Now stay right here, I say, as she cackles and takes off shouting, I'm a bad girl. <laughs> the school years are an arc of images, a miniature adult in first grade consoling a scared, sobbing friend. In high school, telling me about a new girl named Jess, who is funny and smart and nice, and how there is just something about Jess. I feel like I have to protect her. Caitlin was innately kind in a way I was not when I was young. I always marveled at that. Where did that goodness come from? And that fire that was there from the beginning. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. So that's it's just such a sense of her. In a nutshell. <laughs> Did she, did she know that you were going to write this? You know, no. I don't think so because I never had any interest in writing the personal, mm. in writing any kind of memoir. I liked fiction. And, and could you, when you were writing it, um, you know, could you, could you feel her? Was it sort of like having a conversation with her? I can just kind of imagine you you know, at the computer, you know, definitely being emotional and crying at certain times, but, but also laughing and definitely you know, just connecting with her in a way. Yes. When I first started writing it, I actually, I needed to feel like we were doing it together. I really needed to feel connected to her. And I even had, you know, by the, the first draft said by Marianne and Caitlin O'Hara, it, it, and also, I just feel like she muscled her way in she did. from the spirit world because, you know, she's she definitely flavors this book all the way through. And everything about the book, like, I just had this image for what it should look like. Mm -hmm. And this is what it looks looked like in my mind. And, and, yeah. and it's beautiful inside. I mean, she, she loved art so much. She would love this book. <laughs> And can we just talk about how much you would love the the inside pages? Like yes, that? the end papers. Really cool. It's really a beautiful cool. montage of all of her little um, items. She had like a little sort of altar box that we kept while she was waiting for transplant that had religious artifacts and little things and stones and crystals. And it was nice. Oh, it's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, in, in one way, this, this book is, um, you know, it's a lot about Caitlin's search for meaning while she was here and your search for meaning after she passed. And I, I guess, you know, we're all seeking these answers, you know, and we all wonder about time, you know, and this, this notion, I, I mean, Einstein told us that that, that, that time doesn't really exist the way we chronologically live our life. That's not, that's not the way it is. Like everything is happening all at once. And so what does that mean for loss? And so I'm just, I'm wondering, it's very, I mean, it, the whole book is just kind of an exploration, but I'm wondering if you could give us a few nuggets about, <laughs> oh, about Caitlin's search and about, and about your search and, and you know, what you might've found. Well, from the very beginning as well, I, she and I, back when she was around 19, she had gotten interested in a little bit of psi things and, and soul readings and, and such. Some of them, which I document in the book, were extremely from afar, anonymous, kind of bone chilling. Um, one in particular that I write about in the book, where she had these Nazi dreams all her life, she would be plagued by these Nazi dreams. And she had this soul reading with this woman from afar who had just said, oh, no, 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 you could never be a Nazi. 
you were a child prodigy musician in Czechoslovakia and you were killed at the age of 11. Did, did anything happen to you in this life at age 11? And that was the year Caitlin came close to death. She had half her lung removed. She was very sick. So that sort of stuff was interesting. Caitlin became um, interested in the, the reincarnation research that has been done for years at um, the University of uh, Virginia Medical Center. And a lot of it is really compelling. There's a lot out there, but once she had gone, I wanted to believe all that, but I just felt like a completely gullible, grieving mother. And I would read these books that were comforting in the moment, but then I put them down and just be sobbing on my bed. And then what happened was I started receiving like so many signs and coincidences and synchronicities that really to discount them after a while just came to seem myopic. And so then I, I in the book, I go on a, more of a search for, well, what are the, what answers are out there? What have people of science come up with? And they actually haven't come up with that much. <laughs> so um, that's a big part of the journey of the book. And I have to say that uh, as far as Caitlin coming through uh, there th there is something there is something more i have come to believe there is something more and and also i have to say that all of this is so magical and wonderful nothing that any of us created you existing me existing the planet everything in beautiful balance should be in balance <laughs> um that all that exists so is it really that much of a stretch to believe there's at least one other level uh, higher than this so no science has not ever been able to prove that consciousness uh, cannot survive the death of the body but so so there's no answer so why not yeah who knows i don't know i i, I make no declarations but i tell people in the book what happened and people can make up their own minds. But I think at the end of the day, what really matters is that if you think about all that, what really matters is that you're thinking about your life now. Like really recognizing the fact that you are temporary, that it's all going to come to an end. Maybe not for 40, 50, 60 years, but it will. Mm -hmm. So instead of just like being on that treadmill and getting to that point and then being the old man who's like, oh, I should have spent more time with my family. Then, you know, Think about it now and think about the life you really want to live. Like Caitlin's friends have done that. They've used her passing as inspiration to, you know, Katie living in Spain, doing the literary translation she's always wanted to do. Jess creating the Caitlin O'Hara um, Community Health Center in Kenya. Um, Shelly going to grad school because Caitlin encouraged her to write. So I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah, that is powerful. And just like she said, that she she feared that would be the case, but of course. <laughs> well, it's not a bad purpose to have in life. Exactly. Exactly. It's, you know, incredibly beautiful. I, I think we have to um, talk about the process of writing this book, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm so curious to know, you know, where you were when it was when you first got the first kind of flicker of it and and then what happened you know if you could kind of talk us through the 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 process of writing it which is you know you've written a novel and a short story collection and you know this is a whole different beast yes it is um well it's funny I guess, you know, there's a part of, I think, every writer who's sort of standing apart while anything in their life is going on and watching and saying, well, I'll probably write about this in some form mm. at some point. And I must say, I started taking notes to so many like strange occurrences were happening when Caitlin was in the ICU that I really thought she was going to make it. I thought they were signs that she was going to make it. But I, I actually recorded myself before she passed. Wow. Leaving myself a message saying, I think you're going to have to be brave and talk about all the signs you're getting. Wow. And, and 
so I guess maybe it's some on some level I did know I would write this. Yeah. And then it just seems so important to not let her be forgotten, you know? She was just such an incredible soul. She wanted she wanted to live. She wanted to get a master of public health and help affect public policy. She spent the last two years of her life trying to save a healing garden at Children's Hospital in Boston. Mm -hmm. And it felt like, and I started writing on the blog more and more. It was the only kind of writing I could do in those early months. And I would just get wonderful feedback from strangers who said, you know, this writing helps more than you may know, so keep it up. Yeah. And then literally nine months later, Nick and I were walking around Walden Pond and I, I just thought, I, I have to write a book. I can't just keep writing blog posts. And if, if writing the book is going to help people, I would like to do it. Mm. And it will be um, a tribute to Caitlin. And she will write part of it too. So then as far as process wow. goes, I had to, uh, you know, some people said, oh, just turn the, blo bo um, the blog into a book. Well, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. work. But I did like print out all the blog. I had it in piles all over the place. I had tons of emails and text messages and then all my own writing, you know, the actual writing I was doing as, as the memoir work. And it was really unwieldy. Um, at one point, a writer friend had said, uh, have you ever heard of, I write about this in the book, have you ever heard of Danny Shapiro's memoir writing retreats? And I said, no, um, but I wrote to Danny and, you know, magically she had a spot for me like in two months. and. Having 10 pages to have ready was like a, a goal that I could focus on because honestly, in those days, I was really not functioning well at all. Like, yeah. I think if you're going through any kind of grief, like give into it, let it happen. You know, if I took a shower, I was happy and having 10 pages was like a good goal. And so I had those 10 pages. And then um, it was really like three years ago right now that I was really in the thick of writing it. And it, and I, I really wondered whether I could do it because it was unwieldy. Did you have the structure or did this, did you have to claw your way to the structure? Do you know how you were going to tell it? I did. I knew I wanted to tell it in discrete chunks mm -hmm. and I wanted to write, tell it not in any kind of sentimental voice whatsoever. I wanted to be a bit distanced. And I, in, originally there were, every section was on its own page, but we couldn't, I would, the book would have been double in size. So now we have the, the little leaves that separate the parts, but I wanted it to just be like, here's a moment of being, here's a moment of being, here's a moment of being, here's a memory that's triggered by this moment of being. And so there was a structure and the whole arc was me looking for what now, what am I for? what is the point of all this? How am I ever going to get through this? Mm. How am I ever going to want to live again? Will I ever want to live again? And, and as I say in the book, grief, <laughs> grief was like a sine wave, you know, it was up and down and up and down. It still is. Yeah. I still cry. And then an, an hour later, of course I still cry. I miss her every minute. And an hour later I can look completely normal and I am completely normal. Like grief and joy can coexist forever. And I plan for them to coexist forever. And, and the book must have given you a sense of purpose and meaning as well while you're, you know, while you're asking all these questions, you know, you have this thing that you're trying to write, you know? Right. And I really felt like I've never wanted to like self-publish anything, but I was like, this, I will self-publish this book if I have to. <laughs> this book will get into the world. And oh, I, that's I was just really so, beautiful. Yeah. Can, do you, can you show us that little yes. clip? She, she showed this to me yesterday. It's pretty You'll funny. See. Um, You'll see. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to share the screen again. <laughs> oh, where is it? This is Marianne speaking to her future self. This was um, <laughs> January 25th, 2018. Okay. If you ever managed to finish this book make it into something good I want you to remember how impossible it seemed on this day when you had hung it all up and then put it into piles and tried to make a co 
coherent story. I mean, the pages are everywhere. They're just piles and piles and piles and piles. And... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so and hilarious. That wasn't even the upstairs had piles all over the third floor. First of all, the tone in your voice, you know, and the sigh at the end, and it like, just brings back the, the middle of a book, that horror of being in the middle of a book and feeling yes. like you are never going to come out. Like, I, really, I was, uh, at that point, I was doing 25 pages to take to a, a writing conference in Italy. That was January of 18. And I had been writing a novel while Caitlin was waiting for transplant. And I just thought, send the novel to the workshop. Are you really going to be able to write this book? And then I was like, no, you must. <laughs> you must. <laughs> so, but I'm glad I took that video because now I would look and just like think, gee, I guess it wasn't that hard. How did I do it? <laughs> what the heck? What were those? What, why were those things posted on your walls? Oh, so that was something I learned from one of my wonderful teachers in grad school, Pamela Painter. And she taught us to cut up a story and I will even do it. I did it with an essay I wrote last week where I just, sometimes I just need to live inside the, the, the words and you can, you cut the, the story or whatever into its component parts and you hang them up and you just sort of look at them and you think, well, wait a minute, this is, this is better over here. And you just sort of see how the flow goes and, and it just, I just remember teaching it too when I taught a few times and just saying, just do it and you will see. And it's true. Everyone who does it is just like, oh yeah, yeah. Look at this big chunk here. I don't need that. I'll cut that up. And then I move this here. And um, so that is how I, I did that a lot with this book. I do it with everything. And I just, it just helps me tell the story in a really clean way. And okay. So that was January 18. Mm-hmm. When did you hand in the book to be read by editors? Um, my agent had it the summer of 19. Okay. And um, she and her assistant were really great in like helping me tweak it. And then it was summertime and she said, it's not a great time to submit it. So let's wait till after Labor Day. And she really thought Harper One would be the best place for it. And they, t they published it. Wow. And they have been really lovely. Oh, that's they're a soulful house. Nice. And they're and all out in San Francisco, so they're kind of laid back. <laughs> and, and so many, many revisions from that moment um, until you sent it out. Did, did um, it do many revisions? Um, like, you know, when you were just trying to put it together and everything. Oh, well, yeah. At that point, I mean, I gave it to my agent, Stephanie, earlier than I might have. Normally, I like things to be really finished. But I was still kind of close to it. And she was really good about saying, okay, we need to know a little bit more here, here, there. But, mm -hmm. and then my editor, the only thing he really wanted to do was he wanted me to write a preface because I just throw people right in to the book. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he said, I, 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 I think a preface is a good idea. So, I, and were I, there any parts that you were, that you were dreading writing or scared to write or avoided writing? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, yeah, the horrible scenes in the ICU. Yeah. And I, and actually I wrote them and I really haven't looked much at them since I had to reread them, of course, for editing purposes, but they were pretty much fine the way they were. And then I read the audio book and I oh, had to I ask you about that. Yeah. And I had practiced, I read the audio book. I, I read the book aloud to practice in September and in December because I knew I was going to be recording. So I did have to practice reading those parts. And those parts I couldn't get through when I was practicing. Oh. I couldn't. And then, but in the recording booth. Wow. I was, I did it. I listened to a little bit of the audio today. I think I sound okay. <laughs> so. Oh, and, and, you know, of course, people like to ask about catharsis, you know, and how does it feel to have written it? To have gotten it up and out of your body. That's not the way I always feel about yes. my work. Like it's, I have gotten it up and out of my body, whatever that was, it's out. Yeah. And it, it's kind of a good feeling. I'm wondering 
you know, how, how it feels for you. It feels really wonderful. I'm, I am so happy that this book exists and that it, I wouldn't change a word. I love the way it looks inside and out. I'm really, I was really nervous that I would get sick or something would prevent me from recording the audiobook. I really felt like it had to, it had to be my voice. It couldn't be an actor with poet voice at all. Mm -hmm. I needed it to be me, to be authentic. And once all of that was done and the, and I feel like I, a big part of my life's work is, is finished. I really want to go back to the novel I was writing, but this, it feels really good. And I'm just so happy for Caitlin. Mm. Just in the last 24 hours, some people have finished it. People I don't even know who've written to me. And I know it's doing the job I hoped it would do. And that is to inspire people. And that makes me so happy. Let me just talk about love for a second, because I feel like one kind of thing that astonished me after my mother died um, was the understanding about love being eternal. You know, I just, you know, that sounds all nice and fine and everything, but I was really, really struck by, by the fact that, that her love for me still exists and I feel it and it, it feels permanent, you know, like a, like a, an element, you know, <laughs> it just, um, and I, I, I wonder how that works with a daughter and, you know, Caitlin's love for you and your love for her. How, how has that been? You know, <laughs> I, I love that. And I know you were so close to your mother and I love that you recognize that and feel it because I have come to believe it too. It, it, it's eternal. It's, and it's the most important thing there is. I, I just feel like I hold her to my heart all the time. I feel like she's with me. I, I can feel her in my head and that love is, um, it's always there. And if there's a part, Caitlin wrote this mother's day post as a surprise for me in 2015 during the transplant wait. And she never really wrote on the blog. She didn't want anything to do with it really. But she had said at one point, she was saying nice things about me. And she said, you know, to anyone who thinks you can get through pretty much anything on your own, if you really have to, I'm here to tell you, ha ha, you can't, you need people. And I, I wouldn't be here without her. And I feel the same way. Like, I'm so grateful that I have so many wonderful people in my life who I, who love Caitlin and still want to talk about her and we laugh about her and we cry about her and that love is just always with us. And it, I, I don't ever want that to change. And I, yeah. And talking about Einstein, I mean, we could have a whole interesting conversation about all of that time and eternal love. And it does sound, oh, so nice, but really at the end of a life, what really matters, mm -hmm. what really matters. Mm -hmm. Think of someone like Bernie Madoff dying in prison, you know, like really sad. The choices people right. make. Right, right. Um, do you, can, speaking of, you know, kind of end of life stuff, do you want to talk a little bit about your end of life doula work? Yes. Um, right now I see myself more as a spokesperson for end of life doulas and end of life doula is like a, a birth doula only on the other end. And they provide support and comfort to the, the client and in their families at the end of life. I have always been a, um, a volunteer. I love volunteering and I used to volunteer at the Brigham and women's hospital in Boston, always wanted to do hospice. I prefer to work with the patients who are really sick in the hospital. I'm the one who wants the dying patients, not the maternity. Um, mm -hmm. I just have always felt comfortable with people at the end of life. They just seem to like know what's important. A lot of them or, and I like providing a little bit of comfort. So I've always liked that. I had decided to do this end of life doula class. Um, number one, because I wanted to do hospice volunteering. And I thought it would be nice training. And number two, I wanted to be able to really have a good sense of the state of end of life 
care in our culture because it needs improving. And I certainly saw that firsthand. Um, you know, the last two weeks of Caitlin's life were, we hadn't, we hadn't ever, we should have thought about it, but we hadn't. We should have, we should have at least acknowledged it could happen and things could have been different and better, but we didn't. And, and that's a human thing, but it's time for us all to sort of recognize, you know, again, that arc of a human lifetime and, and give a little thought to it. So anyway, I had planned um, a year ago to start hospice training, but COVID has um, nixed that for the moment. But as soon as I can, and I am vaccinated, as soon as I can, I want to do hospice um, volunteering. And I particularly, particularly like um, doing legacy work, helping people write their um, life stories. And I, I actually wrote an, um, a a thing that was in Time Magazine about that a couple of weeks ago, last week, and just how valuable it is and how I've missed my chance with my own daughter and my own mother. So I'm going to be doing some legacy workshops at the end of May through some bookstores. And mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that, just helping people. And it's different from oral histories. I've used those a lot for um, my writing research where you want the details of somebody's everyday but a, a, um, a life interview is a little more focused and you don't want hours of somebody sort of rambling on maybe, you know, a nice half hour video that you can give to friends and family. Right, right. And you don't have to be at end of life either. You can do it at any point in your mm -hmm. life. It just helps you. Where am I going? Where am I? What would, what do I want? Yeah. Um, one thing I forgot to ask you, and then and then I think we're going to go to the audience Q&A. So if you okay. have questions, put them in the Q&A thing. Um, why Little Matches? Can you tell us that, why it's called Little Matches? Well, it's from Virginia Woolf, from To the Lighthouse. And um, Caitlin loved Virginia Woolf at a very young age, which astonished me and delighted me. <laughs> and uh, To the Lighthouse was kind of a, a little fun um, thing because I've always had this sort of obsession with the passing of time and when she read the time passes section section of, of that book she she was like oh yeah I understand you now mom and because uh, she would always be like oh mom time passing time passing but it is kind of a weird <laughs> obsession of mine and there's a, a line in in toward the end of that book where um, Virginia Woolf says you know um, looking for the great revelation the great revelation perhaps never did come. Instead, there were little daily illuminations, matches struck in the dark. Mm. And that's what it is. It's me going along in my darkest hours, lighting matches, mm. looking to light the way. Yeah. For readers. That's what it's from. Thank you. Um, okay. So Adam, I think we're ready for, for okay. Q&A. Showing the book again. <laughs> Which we will actually have in store. Brooklyn Booksmith is now open. We have Marianne's book in store. We have some of Lindley's books as well. And uh, Marianne, I believe you, um, you're you open to um, personalizing. If anybody has any personalization requests, I can definitely I would add absolutely them to love to. I'm going to go into the store um, this week and sign. And I actually, I'm, I love doing the fun things with book selling. I had a little stamp made of Caitlin's little um, tongue in cheek. Whoops tongue-in-cheek um, signature. She would draw a little cat. Awesome. And so I'm going to stamp the book. So, That's fantastic. Um, I, I hope you, whoever is watching, will please support Brookline Booksmith, even if you have already bought my book and don't want to buy another one. <laughs> buy Lily's book. Buy any book. Please support such a wonderful local bookstore. I appreciate that so much, Marianne. Anybody who wants a personalized copy can um, email um, tickets at brooklinebooksmith.com. I'll put that in the chat um, so everybody can see that. I'll do that right now, but I promise we'll go to questions. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. That was that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. I really appreciate it. Lily's been Zooming forever with her new wonderful book, <laughs> Writers and Lovers. <laughs> and I really appreciate her being here tonight with me. It was really kind. Oh, you know, oh, I, I don't want to forget. I want to point people to... Um, to your essay in Lit Hub that came out this morning. Um, really, really good essay about the writing of the book. Really well written. Thank so you so I much. Read that too. Thank you. 
And I'm putting a link to Marianne's book on our website as well, if you'd still like to get a copy. Um, all right, cool. So we got some questions here. If anybody has um, questions, please drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, our first question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, when you say one of your hopes was to inspire your readers, can you be more specific? Inspire us in what way? Um, inspire people to really think about the meaning of life, as trite as that might sound, but really think about what are you doing with your own life? And are you, I, I find that purpose in life is kind of necessary. That, that's a big conclusion I drew at the end of this book. And that when you find purpose, usually happiness is just trotting along right beside it. So um, yeah, inspired to really, it's, this book is meant to be, yes, it's my personal story, but we all suffer, we all deal with grief. Um, I want this book to, to have a universal message for people that um, it's okay to like look for, for purpose in your life. And, and when you find purpose, like Caitlin had, um, actually, you know, not to go off on a tangent, but that first year of waiting for transplant was really hard for her. She was kind of confined to an oxygen machine and, you know, in her apartment. And then she um, got involved with trying to save this incredible healing garden at Boston Children's Hospital. And suddenly her life had purpose again, and she could do it all from the apartment with the oxygen on and her computer. And that led to her saying, you know, I want when I'm done, when I get my transplant, I want to get her mass public health and I want to sleep. So that's what I meant. Thank you. Well, that's beautiful. Um, from Nicole uh, Bernier, uh, I know you had, a, had very Hi. strong feelings about the process of organ donation and transplant. Can you talk a bit about what you discovered or learned about how the process can be made better? Uh, it's so tricky. Um, Unfortunately, it's it's a fraught process because there. Basically, you have to wait for somebody to die, and they have to be the right match, and you can't plan that. I think the best thing that people can can know about organ donation is that the the reason Caitlin didn't get her lung transplant for so long was because there's a scarcity of organs. People uh, are afraid they don't, they don't think about it. They, they're afraid that there's something wrong with doing it, that it might hasten their, some, their loved one's death, which is absolutely, it's, it, it's, it's such a, a really, um, I'm missing the word. It's really tightly controlled and it's completely ethical and it's really the scarcity that, that is the problem. If Caitlin had been a six foot tall man, she would have gotten lungs very, very quickly, but she was a five foot two small petite female. And there just aren't that many small organs to go around. Um, from Billy Duffy, uh, what did yesterday slash launch day feel like? I realize not an easy question. Uh, I've been stalked by birds for 24 hours. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin sends birds. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, yesterday was really lovely. I spent it with my husband and a couple of really close friends. My husband has this uh, trail that he's been building called the Forgiveness, Love, and Kindness Trail in the acres <clears throat> behind his office. And we hiked that trail and we buried some little things for Earth Day and um, had a nice dinner. And my friend made a celebratory cake and it was just quiet and kind of sacred. And that was the way I wanted to spend it. That sounds perfect. It was. <laughs> um, from Delia Cabe. Um, Delia. How did you handle deciding what to withhold and what to include? Did you have private moments you wanted to retain for yourself? You know, it was kind of like any kind of piece of any story. I, I just chose what I needed to use to tell the story. And 
there was only one thing that I had put in and then I took out, it was something I had found of Caitlin's and I mention it, but I don't put it in. It was something I found in her desk. Um, she had seen a, a psychiatrist while she was waiting for transplant um, to deal with some anxiety. And he had had her do this fear exercise and the fear exercise was all about her fear of losing me because you kind of, you really, when you're really sick, you need one person who will devote themselves to you. There's just no question. And um, I, I had put that in and then I took it out. I thought that was too private. But other than that, it was, it was basically, I went according to the rules of storytelling. Does the story need it? Does the story not need it? The story I'm trying to tell. So. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Um, from Sarah, I'm so sorry, I'm about to butcher your last name, uh, Liz Whiskey? Lazowski, sorry. Uh, what is the best approach to beginning a life journal? Uh, thank you for an amazing story, Marianne. I'm a widow and I echo your feeling that you don't ever want Caitlin to be forgotten. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. And I'm sorry for your loss. You mean um, what I was talking about, the legacy stories? Um, I'm assuming, yes. Would you best think approach to beginning a life journal? Yeah, well, um, you can... You can look it up. I mean, there are certainly look up doing legacy workshops or life stories. I am going to be doing some workshops. Um, they're on my website and I have like questions that I can share with people and just share tips with people for how to approach people to do a life story or um, questions that might be good to ask. And um, if you want to email me, I can <laughs> I have on my website, you can email me. But it, it, it's, it's it, it, it all comes down to like, you know, purpose, meaning, what was a meaningful moment in your life? Awesome. Um, from Michelle Rito, uh, was it scary to move from writing fiction to nonfiction? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was scary about it? <laughs> You're, you can you can't hide behind the book, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's my real life. So it's kind of, I never really liked the idea of that, uh, writing my real life. But I just felt like I had to be brave for Caitlin's sake. And um, yeah, so. Um, I'm sorry. No. I'm Do you mind um, giving just a quick... Uh, uh, you can either type it in or just say what your uh, website is. Somebody oh. wanted to know so they could contact Put it you. in the chat? Um, yeah. Oh. It's just my name. Um, and from Melissa Clevins, uh, did you see any significant signs yesterday? Yes. <laughs> Melissa's my niece and uh, Caitlin's cousin. And yeah, one of Caitlin's friends came over and brought me flowers in the morning and um hawks are just a, really a thing with caitlin i write about them in the book and we stepped off out of my back door and this big red tail hawk just started we both like got so choked up the hawk started circling just looking at us and then that was it that's the only hawk i saw all day it was pretty cool wow um, from Deborah Fink, uh, what do you suggest someone should do if they want to get into end of life care or classes to take? Well, there are a lot of these end of life doula programs. The one at UVM is really, really lovely and, um, it's all online. <laughs> well, isn't everything these days, but it's a really well thought out, um, course and it covers like, I mean, you could actually hang out your shingle and be an end of life doula and have a career doing it and really taking care of clients. Um, but you could do that or hospice training is always available once COVID is over, for sure. Same. There, actually, in Pittsburgh where we were, I remember I was actually in the ER myself one day and they had a really um, nice program there called Nobody Dies Alone where they would have volunteers who would come and sit with people who are at the end of life and had no one to to be with them, which is nice. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, from Elizabeth Rourke, uh, you and Caitlin spent a lot of time in medical settings. Do you feel that your book offers any lessons for people who work in healthcare or people who are trained to work in healthcare? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, 
<laughs> As a matter of fact, I write in the book about my amazing synchronicities running, uh, meeting up with these people. Mallory, um, she was a young woman who was incredible and had the same experience as Caitlin. She didn't make it after her transplant. Her mom made sure that her book was published by Random House. Her mom's been going around the country for two years talking about it. And then really weird coincidence, this guy, his book's coming out in, I'm not very good at this, in May. <laughs> he was the head of the lung transplant program at Stanford. And this is his memoir about his complicated relationship with transplant. And the three of us are forming a talk for the medical world, um, a talk that we're going to be giving at the, starting in the fall. Um, patient, parent, provider, three perspectives, one purpose, a uh, model for collaboration in healthcare. So yes, I have a lot of, I, I, I have one copy of my book that's all marked up with medical insights, for sure. Um, from Brittany Capozzi, uh, do you have an altar for her? If so, what is around, what is around it? Is there a ritual with it? An altar? Altar. Yes, I have this little box that she had kept. Um, it's a little box. Uh, she loved Paris. And it's a it's a little like French box, and inside of it are um, stones and charms and little photographs. And actually, Lily had given me a little bird. Caitlin loved birds, and um, that little bird is in there. And uh, it's a little glass bird. And here's my mom's. Yeah, and you had said your mom. I just felt like my my mom wanted me to give you this, and. I don't know why. And I'm like, well, Caitlin would have loved this little glass bird. I have bird things too with her. So it was very funny. Yeah, I have hawk things. Yeah. It's funny. amazing. Um, so yeah, I, I have my own, you know, my little rituals. Yeah. All the time. Um, what were those uh, books that you just um, held up again? That was Exhale. Exhale by David Weil, MD, W-E-I-L-L. -L, coming wow. out in May. Okay. And Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life by Mallory Smith. Sorry. I write about um, both of the Mallory and David in my book. <laughs> Very unusual coincidences that happened with them. That's awesome. Uh, thank yeah. you so much. Well, thank you. Um, and I think we have time for just one more. Um, another uh, question from Delia. Tell us about your collecting of stones shaped like hearts. Yes. Well, um, we are, Caitlin, <laughs> Caitlin was kind of dramatic and wanted a, a mausoleum. And uh, actually her friends were like, only Caitlin would like want a mausoleum. And we are, um, building it and we've been collecting heart state heart shaped stones to build it and somebody actually just sent us more today so yes oh, oh that's awesome mm -hmm. all right um i think we we're just about out of time but thank you um, so much thank you both so much for being here lily lily uh, thank you oh thank adam you. thank you so much thank you to and thank book. you to everyone who's out there i'm I'm just sort of staring at the camera now, pretending for <laughs> you all. Thank you so much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all, Marianne, Lily, again. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a fantastic night. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much, Adam. Bye-bye.